Practical Job Shop Automation, Can It Work For Me? by Herco and Pro Cobots. Today's speakers include Joe Braun, Paul Gray, and Brian Knopp. And up until uh, a few months ago, before the COVID-19 pandemic, most companies around the world have been running pretty hard for the last several quarters. And what we hear from most companies was, you know, I'd love to buy another CNC machine if I can get an operator with it. Because you know, people are really wondering how how do I grow the business? Don't have enough people to run the machines. Lots of stories about the uh, lack of skilled workers. Um, There's plenty of work to go around. Most shops were overflowing with work. The issue was just getting the, the parts through through the machine tool. Yeah, yeah. We sit here in the middle of June, starting to still things open up again and I, I think the pressure starting to come on again after you know a three-month pause um, things are starting to heat up in the market you know the, everybody's concerns about uh, the 401k that took a dive <laughs> could, could rest at ease because things are seem to be rebounding pretty quickly which basically means people are going to continue to retire as planned and the labor shortage is going to continue and certainly a problem that's yep, not going away, as it says in the slide there. And I think a lot of uh, business owners are starting to wonder as they open up again, you know, what are their uh, current risks employment wise? Um, how do they uh, continue to supply their, their customers? Um, there are just a lot of things to be thinking about at this point and due diligence is, is probably mm -hmm. to think a little bit about automation and what it means for uh, uh, your business today. Now, so this slide here, we're gonna, you know, talk about employees versus the robots. You know, looking on the left side of the screen, you know, employees are, you know, direct labor, OPEX, you know, they, you know, have fully burdened with taxes and benefits, et cetera, training costs, you know, can be less depending, dependable. I mean, despite the fact that, you know, there's you know, very dedicated workforces around the world, people, you know, do get, get sick and take vacations. Um, there are distractions that can result in, you know, quality issues, ongoing safety concerns, um, and with a competitive market, retention continues to be an issue. You know, skilled skilled operators and uh, machinists, you know, are being heavily recruited. You know, in contrast to a robot, you know, that operating cost is capex, so you really don't see it, you know, on your P&O. Um, Tax deductions are depreciated. You can take advantage of some advanced bonus depreciation in, in the U.S. Um, initial investment and setup costs. Okay, sorry. You know, one of the benefits of robotics is really empowering employees. Many people think choosing between automation and employees will hurt their morale. In reality, by you know, getting the shop floor employees involved with the robotic systems really delivered a sense of empowerment. It was a tremendous sense of accomplishment by, you know, having people involved with automation. It's, it's certainly an investment in in your uh, workforce, no doubt about, uh, about that, introducing automation. Yeah. You know, overall, the systems that we've installed over the last, three years it's been really exciting to see people that have really had you know, no idea that they'd be working with an automation system you know find themselves setting up and programming machine tending robots and there's just a tremendous sense of accomplishment and uh, it kind of gets them you know re-engaged with their involvement within the company as they uh, you know get to work one-on-one -on -one with the latest and greatest technology You know, a lot of shop managers and owners, production managers, you know, think about and realize automation is a really great solution, specifically machine tending, to keep the spindles turning. 
you know, on a daily basis, they'll see piles of materials in front of CNC machines that aren't running just for, you know, one reason or another that there's no operator present. Machine tending always comes to mind that, you know, what's the holdup? You know, a lot of times people are just really take or slow to react. Um, they're concerned about high initial cost, deployment time, you know, understanding the ROI, what that means, internal talent, skills and knowledge required to deploy and maintain a machine tending system. You know, a lot of people feel that, you know, robots are inflexible. That's true for traditional robotic systems. Um, there's concern the parts are too big or too heavy and that the work varies too much. You know, you look at the machine efficiency across the country, you know, manually, manually loaded machines are average around 60% utilization. Machines that are robot loaded can, you know, achieve 80 to 95% utilization. There's typically over a 20% 20, 20 productivity gain when you add a machine tending system to a machine tool. What we're seeing is about 95% of the machine tools installed around the country are still manually loaded. One of the things that we see is, you can't know, justify doing it myself. You know, a lot of people consider just going out and buying a robot and going after it. But, um, that's a possibility, you know, never under it estimate the ingenuity of a shop owner. There's a tremendous amount of skills that are employed at all shops and, you know, very innovative employees with experience with, you know, work holding and um, fixturing and also programming the CNC machine tool. So while programming has gotten much easier, there's more to the setup than there is just the robot itself. You know, for that reason, you know, there are situations, unfortunately, where automation investments go wrong. You know, um, here's an example here of a $100,000 robot that's for sale, poorly executed, you know, costing someone $86,000 a year, um, according to Production Machining Magazine article in June 24th, 2019. And there's there's, there's no been, doubt that, uh, that that can cause delays in your deployment. Um, it's really a question of of the shop owner and how you want to um, proceed with automation. If you if you think about it, do you want your shop to become the complete top to bottom expert in this, or is is that really the focus that uh, you want your shop to be? Uh, uh, working on instead of uh, focusing on your uh, expertise of making parts and generating revenue. Yeah, so some of the typical reasons why automation projects fail are just undefined expectations, inconsistent project management, you know, really lack of leadership, who owns the project, who's responsible for moving it forward. Oftentimes management don't get the shop floor people involved. Sometimes the scope is not fully understood. Um, lack of after sale support. And sometimes the automation system is just not a good fit for the chosen parts. Yeah, so one of the basic questions is you need to ask yourself, can this work for me? Can automation work for our shop? You know, in this presentation, we're going to have a quick review of different types of automation focused around mills and lathes. Well, you can certainly automate, you know, press brake machines and EDMs and drill presses. But again, this, this particular conversation is going to focus around the CNC milling and turning centers. A lot of people think of six axis robots when they think of industrial automation. You know, mainly you see pictures that come out of the automotive industry and high production facilities with large robots living in cages. Hard these traditional, yeah. 
Yeah. There's a lot of advantages to the traditional automation. You know, they're very fast. There's a size for every application from very small to you know very large. They're reliable. They're great for high production. They're good ROI if you have enough volume. The minuses are they're very high cost. They require guarding because of the speed and the uh, lack of sensing in the axis, and therefore, you know, it makes the cell dedicated. You can't really get into the use the machine tool for any type of rush jobs because uh, once you have a cage run, it's a dedicated automation cell. Because of all the caging, it requires more floor space. Traditional industrial robots are much more difficult to program, take longer to set up, and often require third-party programmers to make ongoing changes after the initial system is set up and installed. Here's a video of a large, or I guess medium-sized industrial robot it has a very really long reach designed to, to load three different parts or three different machines. Yeah, definitely not job shop automation here. Hard automation, dedicated, focused machines producing the same parts day in, day out. The automation is kind of you know synonymous with production. You know, in this picture here, you'll see, you see a row of CNC machine tools, high production automation. There's multiple ways of approaching you know that type of automation. Um, you know, whether it be a, a ro traditional six-axis robot on like a train track type rail system, where you can put a you know a single smaller um, cloud of robot each in front of each uh, machine tool. So when you have high production of multiple machines, it's really not a problem. There's there's definitely multiple solutions out there to consider. Traditionally, automation systems can cost, I mean, easily up to two hundred thousand dollars. I've seen quotes you know, north of half of half a million dollars up to a million dollars. Um, in addition to the cost of all the equipment, the programming costs can be extremely, extremely costly. And that's largely because um, the uh, integrators are doing one-off projects. So every project's being unique. It's not a lot of shared um, or accumulated uh, uh, capability or technology between one installation and the next. Yeah. When you have one robot servicing multiple machines, you have to have a scheduling system similar to like an elevator, you know, servicing, you know, a 20-story building. People are coming up, calling the elevator. This thing got to go up and down, up and down. So the more machine tools you try to automate with a single robot, the more complex your scheduling system gets, which it just dr 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 increases the cost and delays the um, implementation. And puts you at a, at a high risk point too, if something does happen to that robot, then multiple machines are basically going down and not productive. Mm -hmm. so if, you have, if you have a single part with extremely high volume production, for example, something in the automotive industry, this is a great solution here in this picture for a dedicated automation where you know the really high performance CNC machine tool with part a gantry on each side if we're feeding the machine and unloading the machine. Uh, these are extremely fast, very efficient, reliable, best solution for high production, great ROI, very good for um, high quality parts. You know, minus is the cost. Yes, it's not flexible. It's not suitable for all types of parts. More difficult to program, longer setup, and it's not portable. If you have a one part that you want to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week for years on end with, without any making any changes, this is an example of a compact solution that will um, 
achieve what you're looking for in those situations. Another type of automation is pallet handling systems. Historically focused on mold and dye, they become very popular for other parts. You know, pallet handling systems are popular on you know, horizontal machining centers and also some vertical machining centers. Um, pallet handling systems can be heavy and they're good for large parts. They're great for long cycles because you know, the pallets still have to be loaded and unloaded you know, while they're outside of the machine tool. So you need a long cycle time to allow the operator to change out the items on the pallet, the empty pallet, or the pallet that's you know, in queue. They're generally easy to program, built into the CNC machine tool controller. They can be um, loaded and unloaded more than one machine at a time. These solutions have a great ROI. And it's very good for unattended, high capacity production if you have a large number of pallets feeding the machine. The minuses are, you know, it could be expensive. Again, if you want to run through a weekend or overnight, you have to have, you know, multiple pallets, which means each pallet has to have, you know, multiple, you know, fixturing, work holding on each one of those. So it adds up, those costs add up very quickly. And not to mention too that there's there's still quite a bit more labor in uh, uh, somebody coming in to refill, refixture the parts onto the pallets, remove parts off the pallets that are finished. Um, there's uh, quite a bit of manual labor versus a robotic system that will load the actual part itself instead of pallets. The part handling versus pallet handling. You know, part handling use a robot to interact with the part, picks up the piece of raw material, loads it into the machine, removes the finished part from the machine, puts it in a bin, and then repeats that process over and over again. As Paul just mentioned, you know, pallet handling robots interact with the machine pallet, which is capable of handling multiple pallets but the parts still have to be mounted to the pallet. So someone's got to stand there and load those parts in and out of, on and onto and off of those pallets inevitably. So here you see the system loading the pallet with the fixturing on it, getting out of the way, and then off we go to cut. The thing about that you'll notice is that uh, with a pallet system, there's only one gripper coming in and out. And the picture you see here with the, with the robot we can actually have two grippers um, where we can take a fresh piece of stock and do the exchange with one entry into the machine tool with a robot. So the, um, definitely uh, th there's some cycle time loss as well um, with a pallet system versus a robot potentially. Yeah. And, and that last video looked like that part was being held with a dovetail you know, work holding um, vice, which is, those vices alone can be very expensive. And you now, let's say if the runtime is an hour and you want to run 24 hours, you essentially have to have 24 of those dovetail fixtures. So the cost is, it just escalates exponentially. You know, so this picture here talks about collaborative robots um, used in machine tending. This is, you know, very what we call practical job shop automation. Robots such as these offered by universal robots are often the best solution. The advantages are these are really good for high mix, low volume. They're lower cost, which means it's a lower risk of investment. This is your first, you know, um, automation project. Cobots are the easiest to program and reprogram and are very safe. Yeah, that's Easy. one of the things I like about it, Brian, is that uh, when I... <laughs> When I inevitably make a little mistake in the robot program and say the robot hits the machine, it just stops. Um, there's no damage. Maybe I scratched it a little bit, um, but uh, there's 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 no harm to anything when when let's say you do make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And it can be easily moved from machine to machine. You know, there's no guarding required. You know, so if you needed to, uh, you know, break into the production of a 
you know, what is a 50 piece run or 100 piece run or a thousand piece run? If you had a rest job and you had to break into that machine tool, you simply just move the robot out of the way and use the machine tool as if the robot was never installed because you have full access to the machine without any type of robot interference. Um, and if you have a high production job, you can you know, create high capacity systems with drawers and you can even stack multiple layers of parts or create like a gravity feed system to feed a lathe. Very fast ROI. You know, the minuses for this type of solution is, you know, they're, they're basically lighter weight parts, you know, um, Anything above 16 kgs is, is, the, is the limit, and it's about 32 pounds is the maximum weight capacity for a cobot. They're slower compared to a traditional high-speed robot. You know, these cobots operate normally at the speed of what a you know, human operator would be moving at. There's a perception of them being lighter duty, but that's really not the case. You know, there's over 50,000 cobots installed globally, and um, you know, their average mean time between failure was, you know, 25,000 hours, which means they're designed to run, you know, at least five years continuously. Um, but just like everything else, you know, they're not the best choice for every application. Uh, we showed you in the previous slide several different types of automation solutions. Um, as you evaluate your needs, um, you have to go through, a, you know, a series of questions through an assessment we'll talk about later on to help guide you to the best solution. Um, but, you know, turning cobots into machine tending systems is not an easy thing to do. You know, the robot itself is a great, you know, tool. Again, it's very easy to, to uh, program. But you have to ask yourself, you know, what, what is needed to make a machine tending system? How long will it take? What will it cost? You know, where do I start? Um, you need a cobot, mounting stand, pneumatic valves, end of arm tooling, brackets grippers, fingers, you know, part presentation trays, grid plates, work holding, it goes on and on and on. You know, you think about the anatomy of a machine tending system, it's a really c complex um, device in and of itself. And, you know, there are companies out there which specialize in making, you know, turnkey machine tending systems. You know, I like to think of it as, you know, people that want to go fishing or want a pontoon boat, you know, you can always go to like, you know, Evan Root or, you know, and buy an outboard motor and build it yourself, or you can just go to a boat dealership and buy a fully outfitted boat, you know, which is designed for whatever particular task you want to use it for. And, uh, you know, have all the bells and whistles and safety features and you can be ready to go. So Universal Robots is the you know, world leader in collaborative robots. They actually invented the cobot. Um, the inventor, you know, really set out on a quest to, you know, answer the question, you know, why do robots have to be so difficult to use? Why do they have to live in cages? Well, Universal Robots answered those questions and really, you know, launched this product line to change the paradigm on automation and come up with these robots that are designed to work with humans in a collaborative way without the need for a safety cell, which really turned the automation world kind of like upside down. It's unheard of, you know, to have a human work in collaboration with a robot prior to this technology being invented. You know, these are truly easy to use, you know, um, just as a per personal experience, you know, I, I spent, you know, 25 years of my career working in a machine shop. I had no prior experience with, with any type of automation system, certainly not with any type of robot. So, you know, I'm, I'm you know, living example of um, someone that can, you know, step into this, this world and, you know, and, and easily learn how to program a robot, very user friendly. All the programming is done on a teach pendant, which is kind of menu driven. And really what makes these things so special is there's force sensing in the joints, which was designed initially to make it safe and, and it was required to have force, force sensing to eliminate the cages. So 
So this robot bumps into the machine tool or an operator, it's going to stop. Where the traditional robot is going to continue on and cause damage either to the operator and or the machine tool. But, but that technology hit. Oh, yeah. sorry, but what Universal Robots has added with their uh, E-Series robot is the uh, built-in force and torque sensor, which gives the robot not just uh, uh, the traditional cobot uh, capability of sensing a collision and stopping and backing off and making sure you don't get pinned or injured, but the additional force sensor at the end of this robot allows you to program the robot so it mimics the human touch. And we can uh, grab a part push it up against positive stops, just the way you would to load a, a part in a vise. It can really mimic how you load parts and uh, stack parts and so on um, in your machine tending automation system. And the, the advantage there is really that uh, you don't just have to rely on repeatability and accuracy of the robots. Uh, you can actually truly use guiding surfaces to positively position parts day in, day out, 100% reliable that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point, Paul. It really come, becomes tremendously valuable when you're loading a part, you know, into a lathe, for example, that has, you know, step jaws or into a milling vise. So, you know, a lot of times people set the part like on parallels or cut steps in the jaws. But a lot of people are concerned about, you know, how do I deal with the variations in my stock cut part? You know, they're cutting a piece of aluminum or rod into one inch long pieces and their socks and they cut accurate, you know, within plus or minus say a 30 second of an inch or a few millimeters. There's always a concern that that robot's not going to fully seat the part. Or if the part is too long, is the robot going to crash into the machine tool? Um, but when you use the force sensing, you can program to a push, move linearly in a single axis to seat the part into the work holding and, and until you achieve a certain pressure versus targeting a certain you know, XYZ position. That technology has really advanced the success in machine tending. This is an example here of a uh, machine tending system mounted on a stand between two lathes. Um, you know, so the, the robot is loading an extrusion, picking an extrusion off of the cabinet, loading off one into the CNC lathe on the left side of the picture. Then it removes the part after op one is complete and it loads it into the second machine tool. Um, so this is an example where you know there's op one, op two, two different machine tools, single robot. Um, it seems complex putting a robot in between two machines. It's really not as difficult as it sounds. You know, we just look for two different signals coming from you know machine A and machine B, and depending on where that signal comes from, it, you know, the, uh, the it controls which program the robot runs. And the, the point with the force and torque sensor of, it, of that capability adding to the reliability of these systems, uh, also important is the rigidity of the robot stand or what the robot's mounted to. When people buy these robots and they just mount it to, you know, an available table in their shop and they wonder why they get poor results, um, you know, the robot really does need a good rigid foundation uh, to, to be reliable. It's a precision a, piece of equipment, yeah. Yeah. Just one more footnote on that project. Um, you know, we had, that up, we had that customer up and running within two, after two days of being on site. You know, we delivered the robot like on a Monday morning and by Wednesday they're in production. It was pretty neat to see the, you know, how fast these things could be deployed. But to Paul's point, you know, the, the overall success and performance is really determined on how the robot is, is, is mounted and how are you feeding the parts to the robot. You know, so one of the best practices today has been the evolution of combining the mounting stand with the feeder. That way your parts relative to the robot are always in a fixed position. So the only thing you really have to control is the position of that combined stand and feeder relative to the actual machine tool. You know, so if you can take these, all of these systems are very portable. 
You can machine, move them from one machine to another machine. Or a lot of times you just have to simply move the machine, move the machine tending system away from the uh, machine tool just to pull out the coolant tank and clean out, clean out the coolant tank. Then you can uh, easily move it back into place. You know, so when you have these combined systems, again, you just have to teach the robot where the work holding system is in the machine tool. And you don't have to worry about orientating the feeding system to the robot itself. There's also, you know, high capacity feeders available. These are examples here of a multi-drawer system, which have designed, been designed specifically for cobot for machine tending applications. And the nice thing about it is they can be, you know, the trays can be loaded and unloaded from one side while the robot is, you know, um, pulling from the opposite side. So you can have continuous production um, after the drawers are restocked, you just hit like a little button, tell the robot that it's in queue for processing and the robot will just run continuously from drawer to drawer. Here's a picture of a multi-drawer system in action or video. The robot's coming in here to work, process one drawer while the other drawers can be loaded or unloaded accordingly while it's still running and spindle's still running. You can see there's a manual vice there as well. Here, he, yeah, you can see there's some finished parts, clear out the finished parts, backing up on the previous, uh, uh, there you go, you see the manual vice. This is a multi-use machine capable of, of doing the automation to the side and, um, you know, during the day can, can run other parts, um, any custom jobs or what, what might be needed for the shop. And he's just lining up the parts into the pocket corners. That's a, that's enough for for the robot to uh, to uh, pick up a part and reliably load it into the vise every time. And with these drawer systems, you know, we're utilizing the robot to open and close the drawer, which reduces the overall project cost, eliminates the need to have actuators for each one of the doors. And keeps it collaborative too because it'll stop if uh, it encounters any uh, any obstruction as well. You know, so when you're working with a robotic automation system, you know the uh, the grippers and fingers are referred to collectively as end of arm tooling. There's a lot of different types of end of arm tooling that can range from pneumatic um, using like a suction cup. It could be a single suction cup or multiple suction cups on a spreader bar. That works fantastic if you're using, like, if you're, for example, if you're machining um, really thin sheets of aluminum or, or plastic, or if you have a contoured part that you can't pick up after it's machined with a three jaw chuck or a parallel grip, or a lot of times vacuum is the best solution. Um, the vacuum end of on pulling. You know, those two different types where you can buy it with an in integrated vacuum generator or you can have, you know, a separate um, vacuum generator, which is controlled by uh, electric solenoid valves. But regardless of the type of gripper, whether it's a two-jaw parallel gripper or a three-jaw chuck, you know, the, the custom fingers are often required. And you can, you know, we think of the fingers as kind of like soft jaws. A lot of times on a lathe, you'll use aluminum soft jar and you'll cut cut the steps in them. Um, so think of fingers as like your soft jaws. Um, and think of grippers and of arm tooling like work holding. So there's a lot of different choices of grippers. And all of the machinists, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sorry, all of the machinists that are familiar with setting up, improving out, you know, CNC programs set up. They decide, you know, which vice is used and how they set up their jaws. And it's the same mindset for selecting end of arm tooling and grippers. Right. And, and most customers end up uh, making their own uh, gripper fingers once they understand the principle of it, which is, as Brian said, not a, a, any large stretch of imagination for, for any machinist. 
kind of pulled apart. Yeah. Here's a picture on the left of a um, dual, you know, three three jaw pneumatic ripper or like a three jaw chuck. Very popular for lathe applications. You know, most lathes are you know, have, have a three jaw chuck or a collet chuck. So it only makes sense to mimic that type of work holding on the end of the robot arm. So again, three jaw chucks are very common. And you'll, you'll notice on the those um, black customized fingers there, those look like anodized aluminum, but it's actually printed uh, carbon fiber. Um, so 3D printing has really accelerated the um, implementation of cobots. You know, so these fingers are easily designed in like a 3D CAD environment and then printed um, just a matter of a few hours. It's a lot quicker than making machining them on a CNC mill. And um, there's a lot of people that are implementing machine tending systems, you know, find it beneficial to invest just a few thousand dollars for a industrial grade 3D printer so they can do this stuff on the fly. Um, nice the 3D, they, they won't mar the parts after they're correct, the yeah. surface finish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the material handles cooling quite well too. But this is a picture here of a you know custom gripper fingers, you know, grabbing a, a part. It looks kind of like a spool, you know, being loaded or unloaded into a uh, chuck on a fancy lathe. Those, those fingers slip over it, a standardized set of aluminum fingers on, on an electric gripper, just shown on the picture on the right. So you can quick change the fingers extremely you know, um, easily. When you're using a pneumatic gripper, you have to have control valves. So the picture in the middle, and also the picture on the right, are showing different solutions for solenoid valves. These solenoid valves have individual pressure regulators and pressure gauges. So you can set the gripping force um, individually. And then these solenoids are controlled by IO from the robot, uh, which are easily configured um, and named. So when you're programming a robot, you simply say, you know, open gripper, close gripper, and you can choose you know, if you have multiple, you know, grippers on the end of arm, you can just name them gripper one, gripper two, and gripper three. And they're, um, they're all tied into the solenoids. It makes it, you know, very intuitive and easy to use. They're also used to actuate uh, uh, vices that are pneumatic and so on and so forth in the system. You know, so trays and grid plates and pallet systems are used to present the robot present the parts to the robot in a uniform and predictable position. You know, the robot does need to know where to go to pick up the parts, you know, unless you're using a vision system. So custom made part trays are, you know, pretty typical in machine tending systems. Um, you know, generally you take like a piece of valerian or aluminum and, you know, set up whether it's dial pins or grooves to arrange the parts. The picture on the right is interesting. It uses, those are titanium hip cups for medical manufacturing application. And there were eight different sizes of titanium forgings. And what we did was we made concentric circles in the grid plate. So we were able to manage the entire family of forgings with a single fixturing plate by using the concentric circles. And if you can notice, there's grooves cut out in the corner. That's just basically clearance for the gripper fingers. Um, so the machinists can get, can get very, very creative with, with grid plates and making them very efficient and flexible and cost effective. You know, some people flip the plate over and they have another set of grids on the back side of the aluminum. And um, like we talked earlier about, when you empower the people on the shop floor get involved in these projects, it's really amazing to see the innovation and the ideas and, and the creativity. Um, it's just evident and the type, the ideas, um, the results evident in what, you know, what they come up with with different types of part trays and gripper fingers.
You know, in terms of process, the most significant change in terms of process that needs to be considered for SANSI milling applications is the work holding. Because most of the work holding on a typical CNC mill is a manual vise. And the robots don't work well with manual vices. So you have to have a vise which opens and closes automatically. So air vise makes a really great solution. This is a four inch vise. It's a double acting integral pneumatic cylinder which opens and closes you know, using the pneumatic solenoid valves which we looked at a few minutes ago. And you know, these are soft, quick change soft jaws. So you can mill the steps with a profile in these jaws. If your part is bigger and you, um, and you need a lot more clamping force, you know, Kurt work holding and others, um, companies that are well known for manual vices, they all generally have um, hydraulic vices available. Um, the hydraulic vice is a great solution. Um, it does require the investment of a, of a hydraulic pump, which generally could be like between fifteen hundred and two thousand dollars. So if you can, if your part is suitable for a pneumatic vice, that's generally the way to go because you don't have to save the money on the hydraulic pump. This is an example here. The machine tending system, you know, managing a part we had that requires three milling applications. And the customer wanted to have run two parts out of each piece of raw material, and they wanted to have two finished pieces after each cycle. So the vice on the right is op three. So the first thing the robot does is it removes those two finished parts, and then it takes the parts from op two puts them into op three and then it goes back and grabs the op one puts it in the middle vice and then goes back to the feeder and grabs a piece of raw material and puts it in op one vice and then the door closes yeah it's some similar to multi-sided machining with three different vices all in one uh, three-axis mm -hmm. machine you know these are common types of work holding for lathes you know, most CNC lathes are going to have either hydraulic, um, you know, collet system or, you know, three jaw or four jaw hydraulic chuck, all of which are automatically controlled by the CNC machine tool. You know, in contrast to the, you know, the milling machine, which typically uses a manual vice, you know, CNC lathes already have automatic work holding, which makes it a really great entry for machine tending systems all you really have to do is train the robot to, to talk to the uh, machine tool to get control of that open close signal but you really don't have to worry about changing out that work holding that's a video should give an example of the cnc auto door yeah you know in addition doors. Oh, i'm sorry go ahead <laughs> No, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, a lot of auto door systems are um, either pneumatic or just simple drive motors or what have you. In this case, what they're showing here when he sticks his arm in there, this is like an elevator door. Um, we offer a uh, collaborative auto door that is safe for uh, for people. It stops and backs off on any contact when it just just like the robot itself, very similar to an elevator mm -hmm. door. So it keeps the whole package collaborative, um, not just the robot itself. Yeah. yeah, so when you're looking, you know, when you determine that, you know, a, a, ro a cobotic is the best machine tending solution for your application, you have to consider, again, the end of on tooling, the work holding, and the chances are your machine tool probably doesn't have an automatic door. You know, we've really, they've only been popular for the last, you know, year or two. You know, prior to that, most people weren't thinking about automation, nor were the manufacturers at the time. So the majority of the installed machine tools don't have automatic door systems. So look for a partner that includes that into the package. The technology 
where robotic machine tending continues to evolve. I mean, really, it's um, it's almost like every you know every six months or so, there's like a pretty major um, innovation in terms of taking things to the next level. Well, this is an example here where company um, Robotique makes a wrist camera. So in this example, this is a uh, Tsugami Swiss turn CNC lathe where this customer is running continuous production. And they wanted to automatically take the part from the little output conveyor and pick the part up and put it in a bin, which then goes to like a post process, which is a cleaning and then a nickel plating operation. So this is actually a live video. You know, it's a video taken from a production environment. It's a really yeah, nice camera. Really you can see the uh, it's got the built-in light source for uh, really um, reliable uh, image sensing. Um, instead of being a fixed location high above the uh, where the robot needs to pick up and taking static image from a large distance, where the ambient light can affect uh, uh, the sensor, it's nice and compact right on the wrist of the uh, robot. It's lightweight and gives a very reliable. Um, uh, uh, image sensing for pickup. And the wrist camera can also be used for feeding the robot as well. You eliminate the grid plate. You can randomly set the raw material on a flat surface and the robot will go find that piece and put it in the, in the machine tool. So with this slide, this is to me one of the most important things. The safety is extremely important as well, but uh, the the big game changer here with uh, what Universal Robots brought was the simplicity of how you program the robot. Simply just by grabbing the robot, moving it by hand, storing uh, waypoints, and basically making it as easy as possible to program this thing. I think here we show, you know, just how easy it is. Um, you can automatically just ask the robot to align the gripper to that grid plate uh, using the uh, force system. And then it can stay aligned, even though you're dragging the robot around, that gripper remains aligned to the XY plane of that grid plate to pick up that part and load it in the machine. So you don't have to deal with all those uh, axes uh, moving around on you. The robot is keeping that Ripper aligned the whole time he's moving that part around to store the positions where he wants to put it. Here's just a picture of, of uh, the, the job manager. Herco wrote some software to integrate with the Universal Robots to make it even easier. And there's like a depiction there of the grid plate. You uh, show uh, it, it, you basically can load in different parts for the CNC and different programs for the robot, tie the two together into a job and uh, just load it up into this job manager. It coordinates the robot and CNC. And I think as you saw, it runs right on the, the Herco control. There's a setup wizard and, and this is the grid plate, uh, an example of the grid plate visually. And you can just select uh, where the parts are in that grid store that job and off you go. And if you have to bring that job back, if that job comes back in a month or two and you need to rerun it, just reload the job and uh, you should be ready to go. So here he's just gonna load the uh, CNC program, op one, op two, if there are a couple of uh, operations, what have you, the robot program as well. Um, which resides in the robot control. He's got a different grid plate here. He's selecting where the stock material is and saving that job file so that he can rerun this job uh, in the future. He won't even have to reprogram that. And uh, he can create and add new jobs and stack them in the list. So if you have multiple vices or you have jobs that are of the same size or similar size, that the robot can grip and put into uh, the vise or, or the uh, chuck. You can simply just stack up the jobs you want to run. You can reorganize the, uh, uh, the list of jobs. You can prioritize, delete, edit them. It's really simple to use. And again, it runs right on the control. 
uh, the touchscreen's uh, WinMax control. Yeah, and for other machines, um, it, it just depends on what type of integration uh, uh, that needs to happen. Sometimes you've got to pull some signals uh, off various parts of the machine tool to be able to get the robot to, uh, um, to coordinate the robot with the CNC machine. And it just depends on the integration. And that's where, um, you know, pro cobots and, and system integrators will uh, be able to to uh, get you up and running as quickly as possible. And of course there's sequencing between the robot and the CNC machine, as you see here, um, some G code, some robot calls with M codes uh, for, for an IO type uh, integration. And of course, uh, the commensurate type calls uh, in the actual robot program itself, sending and receiving inputs and outputs. Here's a video of an application of a um, drawer system with a robot on a pedestal feeding a um, Sanic Robo drill. In this situation, the customer you had a very limited space requirement. This machine tool is actually so small, it's called a, like a phone booth. And um, the concern was to eliminate any need to you know relocate machine to a different spot in the building because the machine the building was already full and didn't have any available space and those were going to require FDA approvals which is going to delay the project um, and also not to obstruct the machine tool for setup so if you look closely that pedestal has a sling arm which cantilevers the robot into the correct position for loading the machine but you can park the robot you know out of the way by swinging that arm 180 degrees and with the drawer closed, you know, the, the operator still has full access to the machine tool. This is an example here of a video showing, you know, some applications require quick tool changing or automatic tool changing. And you can do that, you know, with, with cobot systems. These tool changers are pneumatically operated and controlled by a solenoid. So you can essentially hang different end of arm tools somewhere within the robot cell and automatically change from one tool to another if necessary. This is a dual spindle CNC lathe. So we are unloading the sub and unloading the main spindle with the forging. You know, um, in terms of average investment, you know, industrial robotic systems can cost, you know, $150,000 and, and up. I mean, they can go, go up into the millions depending on how complex you want to get. You know, similarly, pallet systems, which generally come, you know, OEM from the machine tool builder, they generally start around $120,000 and go up depending on the number of pallets that you have. Machine tending systems from Pro Cobots, you know, including a turnkey system, you know, with robot parts feeding system, auto door, work holding, end of arm tooling, and installation, really you know, ranges from forty-nine thousand to under one hundred thousand dollars. So even in situations where you had, you know, high production environment with, you know, ten or twenty or even thirty CNC machine tools in a row you know, running around the clock. You can see here that, you know, with these types of investment numbers, you can put a, a single uh, pro cobot machine tending system in front of each machine tool. And um, it's generally more cost effective than having a very complex industrial robot, you know, running on a, on a rail system with a scheduling software, which takes up a tremendous amount of floor space and also implementation and programming costs. Um, generally, the, you know, we, can, we see that you, know, you can do single machine automation is still all, you know, more cost effective than a you know, very elaborate industrial automation system. So 
on our on the Procobus website, there's a ROI calculator. It's basically, you know, ROI is important, right? Everybody has to under, you know, understand what their ROI is. And you can plug in, depending on what your facility is running at, you can, you know, punch in how many shifts you have, how many shifts you're running per week, what are you paying your operators, what their benefits. You can put in a robot system cost and it'll calculate an ROI. You know, typically ROIs could be as little as four months. Um, in instances where you're running around the clock, you know, um, if you're running one shift, you can easily get ROI or payback within a 12 month period. And this is just an example of the output from the ROI calculation data. Mm -hmm. This is comparing, you know, an operator making average $15 an hour, comparing it to a robot system of $90,000. Again, you get, you know, payback within one year or less. If you're looking at you know, cost compared to, you know, global, you know, competitive um, so. production costs. You know, if you look at the investment of a robotic system over like a five-year amortization, you can get down to as low as, you know, under $3 per hour for a typical machine tending system. Yeah, so these are types of questions that you want to ask yourself. When you're considering automation, you know, on the Procobots website, there's an automation assessment questionnaire, which asks these questions. Um, but you typically want to, you know, take into consideration how many machinists you have that are skilled machinists, how many machine operators, are they running more than one machine, how many shifts are you running, does your control plan require in-process inspection? If it does, you're still going to have to maintain that compliance, even with automation. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, how do I deal with my in-process inspection plan when I put a robot in place? Well, the answer is you still have to comply to that. You can program those um, control plan requirements into the uh, movements of the robot. You know, you need to consider what materials, what's the weight of your parts, batch sizes, cycle times. And with those parameters, you know, we can recommend the ideal solution for your application. You know, as we talked about earlier, CNC lays offer a quick win since they already have hydraulic work holding. It's a great place for companies to launch a machine tending strategy. Has this is showing the laid application. Yeah. Generally, these can be up and running in like one or two days. So we're coming up, you know, with the three o'clock mark, Joe. I don't know if we want to jump to questions or. Okay. Um, thanks everybody for staying with us. I see we've still got quite a few people on the webinar here. So I'm just going to say one more thing. The uh, design and integration is complex, as you can see from all the bits and pieces here that are required to make a system work. And frankly, that's what ProCobots does. We pull it all together for you. So um, just a real quick commercial for ProCobots based in Pittsburgh, uh, certified UR systems integrator do standardized automation solutions focused exclusively on machine tending. As you can see, we've got a classroom there. We've got a workshop. We do it all there. So now, uh, one, oh yeah, uh, mobile demonstrations as well. So if you want us to come out and visit your plant and talk to you about your particular application, we'd love to 
come and visit you and bring a robot with us so we can have a more in-depth discussion. So yeah, now try it out yourself, right on your own shop floor, and just try it out. So let's let's move to the Q and A here, and let me just see what we've got for questions. Um, question number one: What is the changeover time if you move the robot from machine to machine? I'd say it's very you know typical. If you can compare it to like a CNC setup, Joe. You know, so if it was a job that you ran before. It's just a matter of you know, unplugging the robot from machine A and moving it to machine B, plugging it back in, recalling previous program, and installing the end of arm pulling and gripper fingers. I would say it would take, you know, yeah. you know, ten half to twenty hour. minutes, yeah. Yeah, half an hour, yeah. Half hour tops. <laughs> yeah, tops. Okay. And if it's something if you haven't ran a job before, you know, take a little longer than that. Okay, another question that's come in is, what's the typical lot size from customers you've worked with before? I, th I think they just We've mean lot size. Yeah, it depends on, generally our customers are focused on how, how long do you want to run unattended. You know, so if it's like an hour cycle time, and they want to run eight hours, I mean, eight pieces is, justifies it. You know, but if they have a 10 minute cycle time, you know, um, Basically, just do them. We just always calculate, you know, how many pieces it takes to achieve the number of hours that the customer wants to run. And any, typically, it's between four and eight hours. So we see lot size anywhere between eight pieces and, you know, a thousand pieces. Yeah, it just there's a lot of variables there, and that, that's something that uh, ProCobots can help you figure out. Okay. Next question is. Uh, does the wizard on the machine control work for any brand of CNC machine? Yeah, what we showed you was uh, specific to the uh, Herco implementation, and it's it's actual software that runs right on the Herco control. So I guess to say that another way, so it sounds like Pro Cobots can offer Herco solutions, and that's what the wizard works on. But Pro Cobots mm -hmm. also does systems integration for, frankly, any brand of machine. Isn't that right, Brian? That's correct, yeah. In situations where it's, you know, brand X, you know, the UR controller has wizards built into it for what we call palletizing, which is basically defining the grid plate and where the parts are on the grid plate. And, um, that can be handled from the, from the robot, you know, in instances where the machine tool doesn't have that wizard or wizard application. Okay, I got two more questions here, then we'll wrap it up. Next question, what material would you recommend for 3D printed gripper fingers in general for coolant life and lifting small parts? We recommend like carbon um, carbon fiber, you know, blended with nylon because it gives you the most strength and stiffness. What you don't want is a gripper finger that has any type of deflection in it. Um, most 3D printers on the market use ABS. And you, you do not you want to stay away from ABS because that'll absorb the coolant and cause issues. Um, so you want to use like a commercially, you know, a commercial nylon grade material and ideally blended blended with carbon fiber. Okay. Hey, I said we I said we only had a couple questions left, but I've seen a couple more come in. So. Um, I, I know we're over the hour mark, so if people want to stay with us, we'll keep answering these questions. And um, the next is, do you work only with UR? Yes, we exclusively work with Universal Robots. And then when you look at the ecosystem um, of accessories that are designed to work in conjunction with UR, it's unmatched in the industry. Um, the ecosystem of accessories is similar to like apps on an iPhone or, you know, um, Samsung phone. Um, in addition, you know, UR has global support network. They have over 50,000 cobots globally. Their online training is just uh, very good in terms of, you know, training the uh, new users. So, um, you know, for those reasons, we work exclusively with Universal Robots. Okay. Next question is, what is the maximum payload at the extremes of travel? That's a great question. The, the payload is governed by the model of the robot. So for example, like the UR-10 
can hold 10 kgs, and that rating is valid regardless of where you're at in your range. So you could be fully extended horizontal parallel to the floor, or you can be you know fully tucked position with a robot, and you can hold the same payload. The biggest robot that is currently manufactured by UR is the uh, UR16, which is a maximum payload of 16 kgs. Um, and again, there's no restrictions on where that weight is in terms of its sphere, its full um, full movement. Okay. And so the uh, another question came in that says, "What is the weight limitation?" And it sounds like you touched on that, but just recap. Yeah, 16 kilograms. And keep in mind, that includes the weight of the end of arm tool. Okay. Next question: Will the will the wizard work with earlier Herco controls? Uh, pre-2012 VMX, for example? Um, yeah, there are, are ways to get that going as long as we can. Um, in, in some cases, we can run the wizard from a separate PC and connect it to the control. Your best bet is to, you know, call in, let us know which control model you have, and then we can, uh, we can help guide you on uh, what the possibility is there. But yes, uh, it is possible to run it on earlier Hercos um, to various degrees. Okay. Uh, next question: Do you, do you use mostly UR five or UR ten for the reach? We use mostly the UR ten. I'd say ninety percent of our applications has have always been UR ten. You know, most of the companies that invest in the machine tending systems are planning for you know future needs and also moving it to multiple machines you know so there are instances where you have five is adequate but you know given the fact that these systems are intended to be mobile and highly flexible most people choose to invest into the ur10 and pro robots can help you decide on what model robot makes sense because on the flip side of that too Ryan would be you know putting too large a robot on on a small machine can um, can cause some uh, uh, um, uh, obstruction or issues getting in and out of the machine. It's it's it sometimes That's is the point, a yeah. solution. All right. Okay. And then the last question is: I'm going to answer a little bit of this myself. The last question is: Is there any online training? And I just wanted to put in a a word about Herco. Herco has uh, quite a bit of online training for machine controls uh, programming. But is there any online training for the UR? I think you mentioned this earlier, Brian, but say a little bit. Yeah, Universal Robots has a uh, online training academy, which is free. You just have to you know, log on to the Universal Robots website, create an account, and enter into the academy. And the online training course is just fantastic. I mean, they have done an excellent job. Yeah, you take the online the train. training, you'll have a very good idea of, of what you need to do with a robot. Yeah. Okay. And, and a, uh, another question just came in, what does it take to program a robot? I think you just answered that. So, you know, they're, they're just yeah. to, to kind of say it one more time. So you, there's the programming of the part that you do on the machine control, and then you're going to program the robot's movements separately using the mm -hmm. UR interface. But what, what we showed you, right. is we showed you a videotape of, how easy that is because what you're doing is you're moving the robot around by hand and storing the position. So you, you're not really, um, you don't need to know a lot of code to, to be able to accomplish right. that. So, man, we had a lot of great questions today, and I want to thank everybody for so And I, I also. Joe, I'm going to a quick comment if I could. Sure. Uh, Pat Johnson here from Stone Machinery in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, have the. Uh, uh, the Pro Cobot people and their uh, van and uh, a UR10 system up here for a couple of days of demonstrations before the COVID hit. <laughs> and uh, those guys do an absolute fabulous job of demonstration. They can get a, uh, their system set up in a guy's shop next to a machine uh, or at least near a machine for demonstration purposes in literally five or 10 minutes and they're ready to rock and roll. Uh, they they do do just an absolutely wonderful job. I can hardly wait to get them back up here again. All right. Well, we'll come visit you soon. Thank you, Pat. And uh, thank you. Again, I want to I want to also thank our speakers, uh, Brian and Paul. We hope you found this webinar informative.
We also want to let you know that it's been recorded. So afterwards, we'll send you a link so you can review it again if you like or, or forward it to anyone else you think might like to see it. And then finally, a reminder, you can quickly calculate your ROI using your own numbers and do a needs assessment if you like at procobots.com. That's P-R-O-C-O-B-O-T-S dot com. Again, thanks for attending, and we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Thank you. Goodbye.